Hi, welcome to Bernard's Book Club. And the book that we're currently looking at is The Tyranny of Merit by Michael Sandel. And this is a really tightly argued book which packs in an awful lot of argument. And I'm going to look at it in four fairly straightforward parts. The origins of meritocracy, the politics of meritocracy, the ethics of meritocracy and the alternatives to meritocracy. So beginning with part one, the origins of meritocracy. Here, Sandel identifies both a long term religious origin as well as a shorter term political one. The long-term religious origin of meritocracy can be found, he argues, in a theological dispute within 17th century Christianity over the nature of salvation. That is to say, how we who are born with original sin might be saved from damnation. And this question became a dispute between two basic propositions. Firstly, salvation is a gift of grace given by an all-powerful God, whereby he alone saves us. Secondly, salvation is self-made. It's a product of our free will, whereby we save ourselves. And this debate and these positions were, Sandel argues, very much played out in the Protestant Reformation which was born as an undiluted expression of the first of these arguments, salvation is a gift of God's grace alone, but under intense psychological pressure morphed into the second idea, salvation as self-made. So he tells us that Luther's doctrine, which kicks off the Protestant Reformation, began as an uncompromising argument for predestination. That is to say, the question over who's saved has already been decided. It has already been predestined. And in this version, salvation can only come from God's grace and cannot be influenced by any effort to win favour. But of course, this left a big problem and a really deep psychological need. How would we know whether we were among the saved? And the way they came to deal with this problem, how to know whether we're saved, was to find the answer in a different part of Protestant doctrine, which proclaimed that everyone is called by God to a vocation, to take up a calling, a calling in the world. And if we achieve success in our calling, which is to say success in the world, although this could not be seen as a source of salvation, it could legitimately be seen as a sign of salvation. But no sooner had this question about our salvation been answered than another powerful psychological drive kicked in because for the successful, Sandel tells us, it was psychologically hard to bear the notion that God would take no notice of all of our efforts to be good and godly. And so worldly success begins its slow journey from being a sign of salvation to become seen as its source. And the theology which begins with an all-powerful, benevolent God and a theology of grace and gratitude slides almost imperceptibly towards a theology of self-help and ultimately pride. A theology that proclaims, I am saved because my good work made this happen. My salvation is earned. And in my moral universe, God sees those who do his work and bestows reward and punishment accordingly, conjuring up an image of a God forever rewarding and punishing, where, in the words of Oscar Wilde's Miss Prism, the good end happily and the bad unhappily. And here, in this first template of meritocracy, we can also find the origin of its tyranny, where Sandel argues an ethic 
of gratitude and humility and is overwhelmed by an ethic of mastery and self-making. Now putting words into the mouths of the successful, I have success because of my superior virtue. I am rich because I'm virtuous and confident of their place in the spiritual aristocracy and driven by still more psychological drives to legitimate their success, the elect, that is to say the successful, look down with disdain on the non-elect, those failures destined for damnation as morally deficient enemies of God. And this older religious strand of meritocracy is still very much alive in the contemporary politics of meritocracy, providing the mental foundations for such things as investment bankers claiming they're doing God's work, or the teachings of the prosperity gospel, an American church proclaiming that God gives wealth to those who lead good lives, and of course punishes the sinful inciting its members to proclaim, God's strength is mine, his success is mine, I am a winner, I am a conqueror. And all of this aligns with deeper strains, particularly of American culture. And it has to be said, this is a very American book of individualism and the American dream and the belief that America is great because America is good, divinely inspired with a manifest destiny and on the right side of history. So that's the long-term religious origins of meritocracy and, and it's very rich material. Moving now to the second shorter term, here Sandel argues that this in many ways is a response to the crisis of European social democracy and American welfare liberalism in the final decades of the 20th century. That is to say, social democratic Europe and American liberalism were both in crisis and both looking for some kind of solution to a political landscape transformed by multiple economic, geopolitical and technological paradigm shifts, ushered in by the end of the Cold War and the technologically driven neoliberal globalisation that that facilitated, given political expression in the revolutions of Thatcher and Reagan. And in some kind of attempt to deal with this deluge of change that seemed to condemn centre-left politics to the dustbin of history, the strategies and the goals and the nature of social democracy and welfare liberalism were reconfigured in an attempt to harness the wealth and power of neoliberal markets and global capitalism so that they might become new instruments for social democratic purpose. And as part of that, its old language and vision, and you could say its soul, was transformed and replaced with a new language and vision of a benevolent market and meritocracy as a new conception of moral progress and political improvement, one part of a larger vision of expanding markets and human rights abroad and expanding equal opportunities at home by combating discrimination and dismantling the barriers to achievement and offering an equal chance for all to succeed, where education became absolutely central, the pivotal, all-purpose response well, to everything really, inequality, stagnant wages, the loss of manufacturing. But more than that, meritocracy and its key instrument education was also a moral promise translated into a mantra that all will rise as far as their abilities can take them. A new promise of salvation, almost a new religious vision that resounded in the eloquence of the standout leaders of the new smart politics, Blair, Clinton and Obama. And of course, all of this feeds directly into the politics of meritocracy, which brings us to part two. Um, and it's here where Sandel makes a really powerful case that meritocracy has been a colossal political failure 
with Britain and America as case studies in a diagnosis of meritocratic failure that began with the consequences of embracing technologically driven, turbocharged global capitalism and ends in the kind of populist revolt that had been predicted by the first great critic of meritocracy, Michael Young. And although this is a comprehensive failure of politics, it's particularly a failure for the centre-left, whose role in moderating and consolidating unfettered global markets and the financialization of the economy represents a failure to defend the very values that left and progressive politics were created to realise, namely social solidarity and greater general equality. Instead, persuading itself that individuals now freed from discrimination and the dynamism of neoliberal markets and all the creative energy and wealth that these would produce, that these could be garnered to social democratic and liberal welfare ends to create a fair as well as a prosperous society. And meritocracy was to be both its moral foundation and its effective machinery. But instead, the meritocratic dream of unshackled individuals and friction-free prosperity for all has, Sandel tells us, ground to a halt in the face of automation, offshoring and the power of multinationals. And what Sandel brings back into the picture is the blasted landscape of the losers in this process. A landscape of exponential inequality, the transfer of manufacturing to Asia, outsourcing, robotics and financialization, which together, he argues, has produced significant cultural and psychological injury to the American working class. All of which is detailed in the statistics of the astronomical gains for the rich few and losses measured in suicide and liver disease, and what Sandel calls deaths of despair for the many, giving the lie to the meritocratic promise of universal rising, especially in an America now less socially mobile than China and most of Europe. And central to this failure is the way that meritocracy brings into being a new kind of moral economy, a new standard of who and what to value. So as America and Europe shift from making things to managing money, there is also a shift in respect and reward. And for the working class, this is a story of multiple loss of jobs, the dignity that comes from work, respect, social standing and self-esteem. Now told by their own society and culture that the work they do and the contribution they make is of little value, at best overshadowed by the prestige of the credentialed and professional classes, and at worst, utterly diminished by the unimaginable rewards lavished upon hedge fund managers and Wall Street bankers. And integrated into this new moral matrix of merit are new political categories whereby the old left-right division is now replaced by a new classification open versus closed in which the winners of globalization are defined as progressive enlightened cosmopolitan and open that is to say they are the good people and its losers are defined as tribal, conflictual, parochial and closed. That is to say, they are the bad people. And this is a politics of meritocracy, which is also a politics of failure, humiliation and elite condescension. A moral judgment handed down by the successful, declaring it's not the failure of the system, it's the failure of you so that ignored in their struggle to win honour and recognition in a society that no longer needs their skills, the working class are reduced, naked and dishonoured, sensing themselves slipping backwards, facing obsolescence and the slow fading of their way of life. And Sandel argues at a time where racism and sexism are out of favour, 
credentialism has become the last acceptable prejudice, the prejudice of the educated and the credentialed, that is to say, the qualified. One expression of which is the denigration of white, poorly educated working class men, who are now, he argues, the most openly disliked of all disparaged groups, freely insulted in the language of trailer trash, flyover states, stupid white men and blue collar buffoon dads. And this is the first of many manifestations of the tyranny of merit, a cluster of attitudes and circumstances of rampant inequality, stalled mobility, eroded solidarity, a demoralised and angry left behind and a self-entitled and self-congratulatory overclass. It is the tyrannical rule of the educated, those with college degrees degrees from elite universities, providing over a working class, progressively excluded from the politics that once represented them, overlooked and ignored in favour of a technocratic machine politics of numbers, efficiency and experts, where the common good is reduced to economic growth and citizenship to the satisfaction of consumer preferences. All of which represents for Sandel an impoverished and hollowed-out politics, hiding deep divisions over values and perspectives about the nature of our society, and submerging all the big and urgent moral, philosophical and ideologically contested questions in a doomed effort to escape the messy terrain of ideological combat and partisan disagreement for a technocratic fix of unthreatening, frictionless value neutrality drained of all moral argument. And above all for Sandel, all of this amounts to a colossal political failure. A failure of meritocracy in its own terms and a failure as a way of governing. So that in its own terms, instead of creating a meritocracy, the efforts of Blair and Clinton Obama have simply created a new and deeper form of fixed hierarchy. No longer interested in the numerous ways that wealth translates into power and privilege replicates itself, the technocratic politics of meritocracy has been accompanied by a heroic and systematic efforts by the privileged, serviced by a billion dollar industry and an army of tutors to buy, bribe, cheat and ensure by any means necessary that their children secure places at the prestigious universities which Sandel argues are the great sorting machines of meritocratic hierarchy so that an old aristocracy of inherited privilege has given way to a new meritocratic elite just as privileged and just as entrenched. And as a way of governing, its only success, if it can be called that, is to legitimate inequality. But as a candidate for the good society, it is sorely lacking. It doesn't even seek to empower its citizens, instead insisting that problems be solved by experts. While the self idealization of its winners and the condemnation of those who fail are ethically at odds, with the cultivation of solidarity and the bonds of citizenship. It submerges value division and it prevents any meaningful capacity to collectively reason. It corrupts democracy and above all, it generates the politics of grievance and populist revolt. And it's here that Sandel invokes Michael Young, whose 1958 The Rise of the Meritocracy is the founding text of Sandel's critique. And here we find out that it's actually Michael Young who first argued that under meritocracy the winners tend to inhale too deeply their success and become so impressed by their own importance they lose sympathy for the people over whom they govern, while those below are uniquely vulnerable. No underclass, he says, has ever been left so morally naked. A toxic brew of hubris and resentment that Young argued would lead inevitably to political backlash and rebellion. Such that Young, writing in 1958, 
predicted in a rather precise way that in 2034 the less educated classes would rise up in populist revolt against the meritocratic elites. A prediction and admiring Sandel reports, which arrived 18 years ahead of schedule when, in 2016, alive to the politics of humiliation and tapping into a wellspring of anxiety, frustrations and legitimate grievance, Brexit and Trump announced the first successful assault against the tyranny of merit. And of course, this political failure is also an ethical failure which takes us to part three. And it's here where Sandel's critique moves from politics to philosophy and from an argument that meritocracy is good in itself but insufficiently applied to question the very ideal itself, asking if meritocracy or even the concept of merit can have or claim any moral status whatsoever. But before doing so, he reminds us why merit and meritocracy is such a powerful ideal, arguing the reason why we all want to believe in meritocracy is because it's above all a moral claim about human agency and freedom that affirms under the right conditions we are capable of freedom and therefore we are responsible for our success. That is to say, we succeed or fail by virtue of our own merits alone. But drawing it on ideas from John Rawls and Friedrich Hayek, both very, very different from each other and also very different from Sandel, but which are brought together by Sandel to argue that whatever our talents, which is to say, whatever our merits, we can in no way justly see these as a product of our own doing. That we are good at something is not simply down to our own efforts. Just as we cannot claim credit if society happens to value the particular talents that we have. So Hayek, the philosopher king of free market economics, tells us it's the market that decides what's valuable. And this is largely a matter of luck. Which is to say, if you're good at basketball in a society that values basketball over, say, arm wrestling, you'd be lucky to be a basketball player and unlucky to be an arm wrestler. While Rawls, the philosopher king of welfare liberalism, tells us even our willingness to make an effort, which is always the big thing which is emphasised by believers in meritocracy, is itself dependent on family and social circumstance. And beneath the successful is always an elaborate, if sometimes invisible, web of support. And taken together, these unlikely fellow travellers ask a whole series of questions that directly challenge the assumptions underpinning our belief in meritocracy. Is it really my doing that the market prizes the talents I have, or even that I possess them in the first place? And philosophically speaking, is not inequality due to natural talent just as arbitrary as inequality due to class? And are we not all indebted to some degree to some prior influence? The genetic lottery, God, fate, fortune, parents or teachers? To think otherwise, Sandel suggests, is to slide into hubris and moral weakness. And it's from this position that Sandel returns to politics So we might repair the damage and go beyond meritocracy, which brings us to the final section, part four. And here he argues that any hope of renewing our moral and civic life requires a reckoning with meritocracy and merit. And in this reckoning, parties and leaders need to rethink their mission, reconsider their technocratic and market forms of politics, transform their attitudes towards success and failure, combat elite condescension, restore a place for fate, the grace of God, the vagaries of fortune or the luck of the draw, and recognise that the grievances of the many are not only economic, but also moral and cultural. It means challenging inequalities of wealth and esteem which have been defended in the name of merit, 
rooting out the ways wealthy parents ensure their children gain places at the elite university and take seriously other forms of learning and training. It also requires that we return to a values-based politics so we might reason together about the purposes and the ends of our society and critically reflect how we might live a worthwhile and flourishing life. And we can do this, he tells us, by restoring earlier traditions of politics that go as far back as Aristotle, but also can be found in more recent examples of America's Republican tradition, which sought to cultivate those virtues that would equip citizens for self-rule or in forms of Catholic social theory, which emphasises our obligation to be active and productive participants in a community. And all of these start from the premise that we are most fully human when we contribute to the common good, recognising it's as producers, not consumers, where we develop our abilities, meet the needs of fellow citizens, receive recognition and win social esteem. All of which means putting the dignity of work at the centre of politics and rejecting the consumerist notion of the common good in favour of a civic conception so that we can rebuild our social bonds and sense of belonging. And beyond these general principles, Sandel offers some quite detailed already existing practical ideas from across the political spectrum, from wage subsidies for low-income workers to the complete abolition of payroll taxes, replacing them with taxes levied on consumption, wealth and financial transaction. And so concludes Sandel's Tyranny of Merit, an insightful, tightly argued account of controlled passion, telling the story of what's become of the common good and how it might be reclaimed beyond the hubris and the exclusions of meritocracy in a kinder politics of citizenship, inclusion and solidarity. How well he's done this will be the topic of the next film.